Well, hello. I'm Jerry Oragema from University of Massachusetts Medical School and UMass Memorial Healthcare in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I uh, would like to share with you my thoughts on M mode and spectral Doppler for the next little while. You have to be old to really remember the early days of M-mode echocardiography, and I plead guilty to that. Uh, however, the more I learn about the more contemporary techniques in echo, the more I appreciate the insights uh, that one gets from both M-mode and spectral Doppler recordings. This is a photo of Harvey Feigenbaum. And believe it or not, this is what M-mode echocardiogram machines looked like in the 1970s uh, when I was a medical student and Dr. Feigenbaum uh, was already an established figure in echocardiography. This is a schematic showing what the M-mode echocardiogram is showing you. So here is the transducer on the chest wall. And these are the structures that are being insinated in order. So B, B-mode echocardiography stands for brightness. And this is the brightness of the returning echoes. A is the amplitude of the signal. And M stands for the motion. And as you can see here, these structures line up with this motion chest wall, right ventricular, free wall, right ventricular cavity, interventricular septum, left ventricular cavity. Here you see the motion of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and here the motion of the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve and the posterior wall. The M-mode echocardiogram is showing you the motion of these structures throughout the cardiac cycle. And there is an associated electrocardiogram that's uh, generally at the bottom of the screen. In fact, in earlier days, as is seen here, there was also a channel that was used for the phonocardiogram, which is one reason why cardiologists who trained in the 60s and 70s uh, were very good at timing cardiac events, partly because they could associate these with uh, the M-mode echocardiogram. Now, you'll hear the term leading edge thrown around. This will not likely be tested on the board examination, but you have to go back to uh, early papers on echocardiography to really get an understanding of what the leading edge really referred to. And in this diagram here, you can see that uh, structures such as the interventricular septum, and let's just turn this, these, this diagram on its side. Uh, let's say we're dealing with the interventricular septum here and the posterior wall here. So this is representing the septal echo. And let's say this is reflecting the endocardial echo of the posterior wall. In making measurements of these cardiac structures, it really made a big difference how thick the echo was that was returning and whether you counted the thickness of let's say this line here as part of the wall or part of the cavity. So for example, if you were dealing with very thick echoes, it made a big difference if you were making your measurement from the leading edge, which is the edge closer to the transducer and capturing the leading edge of this echo, again, as part of the wall or part of the ventricular cavity. It can make a difference of 15 or 20 grams uh, in the left ventricular mass calculation. So it 
conventions were established to decide whether or not you utilize the leading edge or the trailing edge. So again, leading edge is the edge closest to the transducer. This is not as big an issue now in standard M mode echocardiography or in chamber measurements, but it does come up, for example, in measurements of the aortic wall. And whether you use the leading edge or the trailing edge in your measurement does make a difference. So here's a schematic of M mode echocardiography and the, the transducer is swept from the ventricular side up by the where the mitral valve is, farther up toward the base, and finally through the aortic valve. And in the 70s, when again, when I was a medical resident, this is what an echocardiogram was. If you ordered an echocardiogram, you got four strips of strip chart paper, one that went through the left ventricle, one that went through the valve, uh, one that went up by the outflow tract, and one that went through the aorta and the left atrium. And again, there was the electrocardiogram and there was a phonocardiogram. So uh, clinicians at this, at this juncture got very good at timing cardiac events with the uh, auscultatory findings. For example, this would be where the A2 would be, where the aortic valve closed. So let's just look at this. Nowadays, we have uh, on one of the vendors has uh, something known as anatomical M mode, which allows you to sweep, retrospectively sweep the M mode cursor through the heart. And so you can get a much better sense of what actually is moving. So here is what I'm pointing to here is the way the septum is moving, interventricular septum here and posterior wall here uh, through the cardiac cycle. And you can see the septal wall. If we start here on the R wave, uh, the septal wall thickens in systole and the endocardial edge moves posteriorly. Conversely, the posterior wall moves anteriorly. It reaches its peak slightly after the septal, the most downward motion of the interventricular septum. So this is just for illustration of what we are actually looking at uh, with, uh, with the M mode echocardiogram through the left ventricle. And um, we are encouraged by the guidelines to make our measurements using two-dimensionally, uh, two-dimensional on-screen measurements. But until the guidelines uh, came out with this recommendation in 2005, many labs were still using wall thicknesses that were measured either on 2D directed M mode or on the M mode itself. So again, a normal M mode motion mode echocardiogram through the left ventricular cavity. And you can see the left ventricular cavity gets smaller in systole and is at its largest in diastole. In fact, it reaches, reaches its largest dimension after atrial systole when left ventricular filling is at its maximum. Here's an M mode echocardiogram through uh, the aortic valve and the uh, aortic valve motion is in between the anterior wall of the aorta and the posterior wall of the aorta. And the motion of the aortic valve is a nice parallelogram as you see here. Uh, you are, in general, you are seeing the right coronary cusp here and the non-coronary cusp here on the posterior side. And notice this nice parallelogram uh, begins here and ends here. And in general, the closure point of the aortic valve is in the middle of the aorta. Now, um, you will not be tested on what I'm about to tell you, but um, keep in mind that
the amount of time that the aortic envelope is open, in other words, ejection phase of ventricular systole correlates with stroke volume. And you've probably noticed uh, at some point that when this aortic valve envelope is very short in duration, and by short, I mean, let's say 200, 250 milliseconds, that is either indicative of tachycardia or if the heart rate is normal, say in the 70s, a low forward stroke volume. So let's take a look at this question here. Here is an aortic valve envelope. And this patient has a murmur. So besides trying to figure out what is causing the murmur, what are some other diagnostic entities that you might be thinking of. So we're looking at the aortic valve envelope and the question is asking you to figure out what's wrong with the aortic valve envelope and to think about what might be an associated condition. The um, ACE exam, certifying examination, does like associations. So the answer to the question not this particular question necessarily, but the answer to the question may be reasonably obvious to you, but the associated abnormalities uh, may be what they're testing. Choices are prima ASD, aortic coarctation, pulmonary valve stenosis, or ectopic lens. So what I'm showing you here is an eccentric closure of the aortic valve. Remember we said that the aortic valve uh, closure line tends to be in the middle. This is off to the side and you can see it on the associated two-dimensional echo. This should make you think of a bicuspid aortic valve. And here you see that uh, there is a uh, northwest to southeast opening plane of this uh, bicuspid aortic valve. And again, we're seeing uh, that the closure plane is eccentric. The correct answer, so what is associated with bicuspid aortic valve of the choices given the correct answer is aortic coarctation. You will have an entire lecture on this. I'm just trying to focus on the M mode or spectral Doppler clues to some of these diagnoses. And here's uh, an example of uh, coarctation in a different patient. How about this question, 49 year old woman, this is uh, actually someone that, uh, that I was involved with uh, from a diagnostic, uh, from diagnostic testing. She is in the cath lab, we get called down to the cath lab because this woman is in cardiogenic shock. Why? This is an M mode echocardiogram through the aortic valve. So the question is, what is the most likely diagnosis? Left bundle branch block, severe mitral regurgitation, severe aortic regurgitation, or none of the above? Ask you to take a look at this envelope. I think you would agree this is very different than the uh, normal aortic valve envelope that has that nice parallelogram shape. And here is three-dimensional echo on the same patient showing uh, this person actually had an acute stress cardiomyopathy. You can actually get a hint of that from this three-dimensional echo, and you sh should certainly be able to see the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve causing intermittent obstruction. Now, this is the M mode through the uh, aortic valve. Here's the associated 2D echo that we got from transesophageal echo. And you can see that there is mid systolic closure as well as oscillation of this aortic valve envelope. And this may not be so obvious to you when you're looking at the two dimensional echo. Uh, and the, part of the reason for that is the frame rate of the two dimensional echo is orders of magnitude less than the frame rate, frame rate of the M mode. Uh, the M mode can be uh, as high as a thousand frames per cardiac cycle. Uh, 
whereas two-dimensional echo on a good day with a narrow field of view may be 50 or 60 or 70, again, orders of magnitude less, allowing you to resolve uh, motion. So mid-systolic closure uh, is, is what was shown. And I just want to point out that you don't have to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to have dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Here is a patient, uh, this is hemodynamics from a patient with uh, stress cardiomyopathy, showing a lot of the features that one sees with the Brockenbrow uh, maneuver in HCM, including uh, the uh, Doppler of dynamic outflow tract obstruction. We'll have more to say about that a little bit later. Uh, how about this M mode here? Here's two-dimensional uh, echocardiogram, and I'm asking you to look at this envelope. And the answer here is congenital heart disease. This is the aortic valve envelope that one sees with a fixed subvalvular membrane, subaortic membrane. And this is to be contrasted with what one sees with dynamic outflow tract obstruction, like I showed you here. Uh, this Opening and closing tends to be very early before the main aortic valve envelope, which is not well seen here, uh, as opposed to dynamic outflow tract obstruction, which one sees in HCM and other conditions where the closure is the mid portion of systole. Now, uh, just a couple of points to, to make some of the indirect evidence that one can get from the motion of the posterior wall of the aorta. Remember, the aorta shares the wall with the left atrium. And uh, what one sees here in severe mitral regurgitation during systole, the left atrium is exploding and getting much larger very quickly. Uh, and that is due to the uh, the torrential mitral regurgitation, which is expanding the atrium in systole. We're showing this diagrammatically here. In mitral stenosis, uh, conversely, in diastole, uh, the left atrium is not decompressing the way it does normally. Here's the decompression of, uh, the, uh, of the left atrium as the left ventricle is starting to fill after aortic valve closure. Look how this line of the posterior wall of the aorta or the anterior wall of the left atrium is really not moving that much. And that's because of the slow filling occasioned by the mitral stenosis. So you can get these kind of indirect clues. Let's zero in a little bit more on the mitral valve envelope now. So here in schematic form is mitral valve envelope. This is a strip chart recording of a mitral valve uh, from many years ago, and we don't record this way uh, with mitral valve any with the mitral valve anymore. And uh, these time points in the mitral valve uh, envelope are given conventional names, which I don't think you'll be tested on. Uh, the here's the E. It's the anterior most excursion in early diastole as the ventricle fills passively. There's the A which is uh, associated with atrial kick. And then there's the closure, which is C. Keep in mind this A to C duration here and how this can be indented. Uh, and we'll come back to this in a second. In fact, we're, we come back to it now. The two M mode findings that give you information about uh, ventricular function are the so-called E-point septal separation, which is the distance between the anterior most excursion of the anterior leaflet and the septum. And when this is wide, it is indicative of a low stroke volume. And secondly, the B bump or shoulder AC, AC, shoulder. Notice how this actually flares out a little bit. There's not a nice smooth closure line. This is um, a leftover finding from M-mode echocardiography that is indicative of end elevation in end diastolic pressure. And, and I tell my fellows, 
these are the Scylla and Charybdis of M-mode echocardiography. They're telling you different things about ventricular function. Here is a very prominent AC shoulder or B bump, which the reflex you should have is to think elevated and diastolic pressure of the ventricle. You need obviously need to have sinus rhythm to get this second wave in the M mode um, envelope. And you have to have a post A wave elevation and end diastolic pressure to have this B bump. Uh, and again, one has to go back to old textbooks to find even schematics of the E point septal separation, low stroke volume, or the B bump indicative of LVEDP, high LVEDP, excuse me. Now here's a patient that has a widened E point septal separation. And as you see from the two dimensional echo, the overall left ventricular function is quite poor and the stroke volume is low. And this is how I think of it. If you are not putting much of a stroke volume past your aortic valve and systole, you will not have much mitral valve excursion in diastole. And that's what the E point septal separation, anything greater than six millimeters uh, on your M mode is indicative of uh, an elevated E point septal separation. Let's take a look at this mitral valve envelope. And what you see here, as opposed to the anterior and posterior leaflets staying together at the end of systole, you see a hammocking or late systolic uh, separation between the anterior and the posterior leaflets. And this is due to mitral valve prolapse. Of course, M mode echocardiography is not the way generally we diagnose mitral valve prolapse, but um, it does have its role in solidifying the diagnosis. How about this mitral valve envelope? Well, compared to the normal, what you're seeing is the anterior and the posterior leaflets are thickened. They're not the nice thin pliable leaflets that one sees in the normal situation. And they do tend to ride together as opposed to this uh, mirror image, double diamond uh, appearance to it, these tend to ride together. This is what is seen in rheumatic mitral valve disease. And this patient is still in normal sinus rhythm, uh, but when you see these leaflets moving together, it indicates that there is likely some commissural fusion and the leaflets moving together. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. When you see this kind of square uh, or rectangular, I guess I should say, pattern with the leaflets riding up together. This is what one sees uh, with rheumatic mitral valve disease. Um, I would add parenthetically, here's a nice 3D of a rheumatic mitral valve in our lab that um, one can see, if one sees relative prolapse of the anterior leaflet, this can actually be seen in rheumatic disease and is not necessarily indicative of uh, myxomatous degeneration of the mitral valve. Uh, with rheumatic disease, if there is cortical shortening and fusion, and you could see, get a hint of that here, the anterior leaflet may prolapse relative to the posterior leaflet. Of course, one can also see this in so-called ischemic MR, where there is apical displacement of the papillary muscles and tethering of the pap muscle. Here, the anterior leaflet rides in front of the posterior leaflet, but it's not due to rheumatic disease. This is a more typical uh, leaflet prolapse situation where the posterior leaflet uh, is uh, prolapsing beyond the anterior leaflet. And here's a nice example of uh, rheumatic disease with relative prolapse of the anterior leaflet. So what happened between A and B? So what we have here are pulmonary venous tracings. Okay, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the pulmonary vein because uh, this uh, pulmonary, uh, paying attention to the pulmonary vein has come a little bit more into vogue in structural echocardiography.
least this is what my colleagues who do echo for structural disease tell me. Uh, so here's pulmonary venous tracing before and after a procedure. What one sees here is a negative flow during systole and a positive slow flow in diastole. Now this is transesophageal echo. So, and this is taken from the left upper uh, pulmonary vein. So you have a negative wave in systole indicating flow away from the atrium and a positive wave in diastole. After a procedure is done, both waves, both systolic and diastolic waves are moving into the uh, left atrium. So what happened here? Well, before we answer that question, let's just think about pulmonary venous flow for a second. With this, this is transthoracic echo now with the sample volume in the right upper pulmonary vein. Normal pulmonary venous tracing really comprises three waves. An early systolic and a late systolic wave, S1 and S2, and a D wave. The D wave basically has the same characteristic and timing as the transmitral E wave. I think of this as replacement blood. Mitral valve opens, blood comes into the left ventricle, replacement blood comes into the left atrium through the pulmonary vein in diastole. Now, what about the systolic components to it? Well, the first component of the systolic wave is caused by relaxation of the atrium after atrial systole. So one does not see this in atrial fibrillation. The second wave is caused in part by the downward motion of the mitral annulus toward the apex and basically a plunger effect with blood coming into the left atrium through the pulmonary vein uh, in during uh, ventricular systole. Part of this is also blood being pushed across the lungs uh, that originated in the right ventricle. So normal pulmonary venous flow, S1, S2, and D. Now, here's a, a more representative uh, pulmonary venous flow again, S1 and S2, these time out with ventricular systole, and this wave here, the D wave times out with diastole, and they follow the descents, uh, the uh, X and Y descents. So here's the normal situation with three waves, prominent S1, S2, and a D. Now, as mitral regurgitation happens, the height of the S wave diminishes and one can have frank reverse flow. In fact, the more the reverse flow, the lower the systolic component of the pulmonary venous trace. So here, this is totally D dominant with four plus mitral regurgitation. Whereas with two plus mitral regurgitation, you still have a preserved S wave. So the procedure that, and let me go back to this slide, the procedure that happened here was a mitral clip. And after the mitral clip, and my colleague, Matt Parker at, uh, at our institution tells me that, um, that they consider it the procedural success when they reestablish the systolic wave in the pulmonary venous flow uh, after a mitral clip. Well, let's move on ahead. Um, so take a look at these next images, which will review some of the things that we've already talked about. MO through the mitral valve, MO through the left ventricle, Continuous wave Doppler in the left ventricular outflow tract, CW. Systole, diastole. What's the diagnosis? Severe TR with reduced RV systolic function. Hard to tell that from left-sided data. Right bundle branch, reduced ejection fraction, right bundle branch block, 
reduced ejection fraction, restrictive cardiomyopathy, severe aortic regurgitation with normal left ventricular ejection fraction, or severe aortic regurgitation with reduced ejection fraction? And that is the answer. Well, how did we arrive at this? Well, let's look. First of all, there's an um, increased E-point septal separation telling you that left ventricular systolic function and forward stroke volume is reduced. So that gives you this part of the answer. And then you also see vibrations, uh, oscill oscillatory uh, movements of the anterior leaflet because the jet of aortic regurgitation is impinging on the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. Now, that doesn't tell you the severity of aortic regurgitation. It just tells you you have aortic regurgitation directed toward the anterior leaflet. The severity of the aortic regurgitation is told to you by this spectral Doppler of aortic regurgitation. Now, this is a very noisy, uh, very um, envelope with a lot of spectral broadening, but the key finding here is the rapid deceleration in diastole of this aortic regurgitation envelope, indicating that you have rapid equilibration between the aorta and the left ventricle. So these are the data that one can get, and here's here are the associated 2D echo, case, uh, echo images. Um, you see that this is a, a bicuspid valve, vegetations, and reduced uh, ejection fraction, big E-point septal separation. And part of that may be because the, the jet is pinning uh, the anterior leaflet uh, in diastole and torrential aortic regurgitation. So this is the key finding in terms of quantitating the aortic regurgitation. Something you should look out for and the kind of thing that you might be tested on is when you see an early closure of the mitral valve. Again, here's where the mitral valve should close, right about on the R wave. Here's the R wave. In this example, the aortic, the, excuse me, the mitral valve has closed much earlier than that. And this is so-called early closure of the mitral valve, which is indicative of acute severe uh, acute severe aortic regurgitation in someone who more often than not has staph endocarditis of the aortic valve. Here's another example of a very, we joke and call this slopacious aortic regurgitation jet uh, in somebody uh, with uh, bacterial endocarditis. Let's move over to the right side uh, and take a look at th this. Uh, so here's an M mode envelope through the pulmonary valve. Here's a pulmonary pulse Doppler tracing. And here is a pulmonary regurgitation continuous wave spectrum. What's the diagnosis? Pulmonary valve stenosis, hokum, aortic stenosis, pulmonary hypertension. I'm making these questions kind of easy for you just to kind of get you warmed up for the real thing. And the correct answer is pulmonary hypertension. So a few things happen as the pulmonary artery pressure increases. A few things happen that is to the pulmonary RVOT pulse Doppler signal, which is being illustrated here. Here's the systolic flow signal across the pulmonary valve uh, with the pulse Doppler and the RV outflow tract. As the PA pressure goes up, the acceleration time of this envelope shortens. And you would measure the acceleration time from when it departs the baseline to the peak, assuming your signal is not terribly noisy. A uh, short acceleration time here in 65 milliseconds is associated with a high pulmonary artery systolic pressure. In general, a PA systolic pressure you can assume a PA systolic pressure assume, uh, approaching 60 if your acceleration time is below 90 milliseconds. We'll talk about that a little bit more during the hemodynamics talk. I was also showing you the pulmonary valve envelope and 
here's the key M mode finding in pulmonary hypertension, and that is the so-called flying W sign. So the pulmonary valve envelope has this W characteristic to it, as well as the loss of the this pre-systolic dip that one sees in the normal pulmonary valve envelope. Now, I would point out to you that unlike the left side of the heart, on the right side of the heart, the right ventricular diastolic pressure and the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure are fairly close. So that the rise in right ventricular pressure uh, that occurs after atrial systole can deform the pulmonary valve envelope because the pressure rise affects the gradient between the uh, pulmonary, the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. You don't see this on the left side because the pressures are so wide, uh, widely separated. In pulmonary hypertension, you no longer see this deformation in the pulmonary valve envelope because of this separation between the RV and the PA pressure. One can see a notch in the pulmonary valve envelope, which we'll talk about in a second. So here's the notch in the pulmonary valve envelope. And here is the corresponding notch in the RVOT flow signal. This uh, we've come to appreciate more recently is, uh, is a good sign of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, this is uh, from an editorial that Matt Parker and I put together for Jace uh, that should be coming out reasonably soon. Uh, it's been actually known for some time since the 80s uh, in work by Akita Bataki from Japan that a notch in the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary valve envelope can be seen with elevated pulmonary artery pressures. This is from a very nice editorial that was written in the JACE by uh, Bernard and Tuzinski from Mass General, which correlates the notch in the pulmonary valve M mode with the notch in the pulmonary uh, transpulmonary valve Doppler signal. And here's a corresponding notch from a patient at our institution with pulmonary hypertension. What causes this notch? Well, the thinking is that in the pulmonary circuit, when there is downstream, an increase in impedance downstream, reflected waves may return to the pulmonary valve and to the right ventricle and will uh, cause a premature closure of the valve uh, and an interruption in the, uh, in the flow. That's, that's the current thinking. But it's important to keep in mind, as can be seen in this diagram, that even within the same patient, uh, cycle length differences can make a difference in whether the notch appears or doesn't appear. And I would also point out to you, this is not something that you should expect to see on continuous wave flow across the pulmonary valve. This is a spectral Doppler diagnosis. Uh, let's move back to the mitral valve for a second. Here's a CW across the mitral valve in a 19 year old woman uh, who presented to the hospital with pneumonia and shock. What should you be thinking about in this patient? This is CW across the mitral valve, myocarditis, aortic stenosis, Epstein's anomaly, mitral regurgitation. Here's a transmitral flow, high velocity, 180 centimeters per second. Diagnosis is acute severe mitral regurgitation. And this fall off, this departure from the normal parabolic uh, mitral valve envelope uh, indicates that the pressure in the left atrium is rising dramatically. Uh, Take a look at this M mode. Exam findings in the 58 year old with dyspnea and status post cabbage would include fixed splitting of the second heart sound, a soft S3, a pericardial knock, uh, 
loud S4, paradoxical splitting of the second heart sound. Take a look at this M mode. This is not a normal M mode. We mentioned that the peak downward motion of the septum in normal, the normal situation precedes that of the posterior wall. Here you see a marked dip in the septum in early diastole and a second oscillation in this movement uh, around the time of the atrial kick. This should make you think of constrictive pericarditis. And this was from a patient uh, that I took care of that indeed had constrictive pericarditis. So the answer we're looking for is a pericardial knock. You'll have a whole talk on constrictive pericarditis. I'm just here to show you the typical M mode features of an early septal, early diastolic septal uh, downward movement and a late septal oscillation uh, that one sees on the M mode. Notice also that there are reciprocal changes in left ventricular and right ventricular filling. When the right ventricle is filling at its maximum, the left ventricle is filling at its minimum. Ventricular interaction. So the correct answer is the pericardial knock. Uh, this has been known since the, uh, since the 80s that this was a reasonable sign for constrictive pericarditis. And the thinking behind this uh, is not, the, the explanation for this early systolic diastolic notch is not really that clear. Uh, in my opinion, I, I think what, what is happening is the left ventricle by reason of its geometry is better able to generate diastolic suction than the right ventricle. Uh, and so therefore there may be a, a transeptal pressure gradient uh, which favors leftward motion of the interventricular septum. The notch associated with the atrial kick has been uh, described as, uh, as follows. If you have constriction with atrial kick, the posterior wall cannot give and so the septum uh, oscillates. How about this spectral Doppler? What's the diagnosis here? Coarctation, mitral stenosis, LV dysfunction, and what is, or, or anemia, high output failure. What is one seeing here? We're seeing an alteration in the magnitude of the LVOT, VTI. Keep in mind that a roughly normal LVOT VTI should be in the high teens, low twenties, but of course is dependent on heart rate. The faster the heart rate, the slower, the uh, smaller the VTI. Uh, what you're seeing actually is pulses alternans, and this is indicative of severe LV dysfunction. I'm not going to spend time on that uh, strain imaging. And we'll finish up with this. What is the most likely diagnosis for these Doppler profiles? Severe TR, RV systolic dysfunction, both or neither. I'm showing you a tricuspid valve signal and I'm showing you a hepatic vein signal. Well, let's explore this. The correct answer is both, and I'll explain why. Again, this is a tricuspid regurgitation signal. The normal signal should be parabolic. This is triangular. My colleague, Brian Gentile says, at UMass, triangles are never good in Doppler. And that is true. This is triangular because the ventricle takes time to reach its maximum pressure and therefore maximum gradient. And there's a cutoff because the right atrial pressure has risen significantly. It's also relatively low velocity, which is a bit of more of a complicated explanation, but there is spectral broadening, meaning this tracing is filled in. Even if it is CW, it's still very bright. So you get a lot of information from this signal that you have RV dysfunction, and you have significant tricuspid regurgitation. And that is supported 
by the hepatic vein tracing. The hepatic vein tracing shows reverse flow in systole because of the tricuspid regurgitation. And this is in diagram form what the hepatic vein tracing should look like. You should have a forward wave in systole and a forward wave in diastole with small reversals on either side. And as you can see, that is missing. And people talk about the mnemonic RICE, uh, which we'll talk about with hepatic veins in my hemodynamics talk. So I'm gonna quit there. And um, some of the practice questions uh, that I prepared will test some of these principles.